Yossi, what is DLD? DLD is a conference which is curated by Steffi Cherny. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> since this year, and, and Dominic, then, yeah. Dominic joined also. And uh, <laughs> DLD is very careful not to become only business or only tech. The tech and business are very important, but there are some other important uh, things in life, which DLD, in contrary to most, if not all other business and or tech conferences, is trying to expose its uh, audience to. So we are tech, we are business, we are art, we are zeitgeist, we are health, we are literature, we are, maybe I should say it's a, it's, a, it's a conference about talent, or talent at work. Yeah, friends. And friends. And of course the community is very important. Now we have a challenge because we are sitting between you and you're going home. And uh, we were supposed to finish at what, one o'clock? I or guess so, yeah. Around. One o'clock. Are you willing to give us a few more morning minutes or you want us to finish at... Uh... <laughs> so let's do the following. We will try to go until 1.20, but anybody who would like to leave between now and 1.20 should leave now and we will continue with the people which will leave and leaving you may affect your invitation to next year. <laughs> So this was kind of a <laughs> slight convincing. Dominic. I have a microphone. A microphone. Uh, what we wanted to do in this session is to try to get a joint opinion of the people what the future is hold for us. A very simple topic, but I would like to ask you, what do you think in your professional world will happen what are the main things which help, help, will happen in the next five years? Well, it's a very difficult question. Um, thank you very much, Dominic. <laughs> okay, thank, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, besides the fact um, what we have discussed uh, uh, during the, the last 36 hours, um, the topics and the buzzwords such as artificial intelligence and how it affects the future of work, especially uh, artificial intelligence and the blockchain. I do think there is one thing that um, appears to me as really important. Maybe it's a very German perspective, but I think there is a phenomena that people who are, let's say, 60 years old and they're in their job for, for the last 40 years have less, uh, will have less work experience as a 20-year-old person coming in and is able to code and is coding for the last four years. In other words, there will be a huge schisma between, between groups within a society. And I do think that the new techniques we, and the new buzzwords will create a situation where we need a lot of psychology within society, psychology in order to communicate the right way and to, to try not to alienate people, to take away their fears and to show them the chances and possibilities of the technical revolution by also in uh, showing what are the dangers. And this kind of bridging, bridging gaps, uh, I think it's, it's, it will be of great importance the next years. I feel that you are talking personally to me with a lot of empathy. Mm. <laughs> Especially among the 60-year-old ones. Yeah. No! I <laughs> I have to tell you something in that respect. You, as you may remember, I supported the four Israeli kids which invented instant messaging. And one of them came and showed me, this is going 20 years ago, you know, not, not now. He showed me a feature and I told him, Sefi, nobody of my age group will ever understand how to use this feature. He said, Yossi, you don't understand. It doesn't matter because you're peer group, your age group is already dead. You just don't recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> Steffi, what are the main, the main trends we are going to see in the next five years? Um, before I answer, I want, you, I want to integrate our wonderful audience. I don't want to answer this. I spoke so much. I want to ask Lynn Kaiser, like Lynn, what are the major trends to your regard? Lynn spoke yesterday about 3D printing. Lynn. Here's my, I can give you my mic. 
Maybe you have another microphone also, huh? Lean, but make it short. You know, it's not yeah. an opening for a whole new speech. <laughs> no, um, I mean... Take an example from the last speaker. Make it short. I will. So I think um, it is incredibly difficult to um, predict what will happen. It's just going to be a tremendous transformation because we have so many things coming together. We have artificial intelligence. We have a revolution in manufacturing. We have synthetic biology. There are so many things that are fundamentally changing how we build things, how we think about things, and how biology actually will interact with us. That it's, um, I think the next 20 years are going to be so transformative that uh, we will not really recognize the world in 20 years from now. Thank you. Thank you for answering my, uh, for my question. Yeah. Any other person who would like to dare and look into the future, please raise your hand. Yes, please. Tell us your name, your affiliation, and a short, I mean short, like short statement, what do you think the future holds for us? And tell us the joke later on about pessimism and optimism. Uh, OK. <coughs> Once, one, one in a time. Very short, what we, what, we, what we noticed also yesterday in the No, first of all, who are you? Ah, I'm sorry, very <laughs> I'm Alex from Visual West, um, from Frankfurt. Um, the biggest question what I see is the social impact of artificial intelligence. We, we work a lot with that and we try to find out how that lowers transaction cost, how that brings more efficiency and more convenience to us. But on the other side, I hear many, many people asking what social impact does that have the next five or ten years? For example, Andrew Eng, the Stanford professor, says we need a minimum salary for everybody without working. <clears throat> so that's something we need to discuss because most people have no idea, but they feel that uh, there's something big coming up um, okay. with the income gap. Thank you. Your name? Hi, I'm uh, Tom Goodwin from Havas. Um, from where? Havas? Havas. I mean, my quick point really would be... Um, where, where do you live? Um, I live in New York, but I move around a lot. In New York? Yeah. And you came here all the, all the way... Stand up. You came here all the way from... <laughs> you, came, you can sit down and then stand up again. <laughs> uh, you came all the way from New York? I came from Korea to New York to here, so I'm quite tired. You are a pilot in a bus? <laughs> 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 it's my job to understand what's next, so you have to go to Asia quite a lot. Okay. Um, I, Your boss know where you are now? <laughs> Don't ask about that. Okay, um, so what? Please. I guess my point is, I feel like most companies have not really embraced technology. If you're Carrefour or Walmart uh, or an airline, you act as if you wish that technology never happens. You kind of, you, you, you move it around the edges, you treat it like a problem. Denials, they are still in denial. And the really profound companies today are companies like Tesla, uh, or Uber, or Hotel Tonight, or Kayak, um, or Amazon, that have created themselves around the new possibilities of technology. So the big thing that will happen, I believe, in the medium term, will be a, a kind of tranche of companies that have embraced technology rather than dealing with like a problem, and that have embraced humanity and what people need rather than coding and technology and engineering. So I think and that's how be how Havas is standing in that respect. <laughs> you don't have to. You can plead. The <laughs> I think um, what I think is brilliant about Havas is that we have a global CEO who is 37. Um, most large holding companies are run by elderly gentlemen who are hoping to go on the golf course quite soon. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> and they don't need to invest in change because they're going to be fine for the next two or three years. Uh, whereas I think where we're particularly lucky is that we have a guy who has the time and the energy to really make a difference to our industry. Okay, anybody want to say something I, for the benefits of elderly people? <laughs> that though they are idiots, they, you can still show them tender love we and love care? Rainer, Rainer, we, we, we have, we, I mean, part of the program Rainer. was together curated with Ashoka. And Rainer's from Ashoka, and I, I, I'm particularly interested, Rainer, what's your perspective on that from a social entrepreneurship point of view? So I don't need to introduce myself now, right? No. Thanks. <laughs> but you can't do that again. <laughs> now, I really think we need to think about social cohesion. I mean, the people in this room are the digital elite. And 90% of the people out there do not really understand anymore what we're doing here. And I mean, look at all the digital tools that we have, all the platforms. They're meant to bring people together and to connect people. But I mean, look what happens to the political discourse today about refugees, for example, as soon as it happens on Facebook. 
that's really troubling. So we really need to make sure that the social side of innovation really keeps pace with the digital and that we make sure that we use the tools that we develop to really look after the social cohesion part, how we don't let people behind and how we can really use and, and harness these tools to solve social problems. And that's our job as a shoka, to take, you know, use whatever it no takes promotion, to do exactly no that. No promotion, no promotion. Too late. There, there is Clark By the way, Parsons. There's Clark Parsons from the Internet, European Internet Foundation. By the way, in how Israel... Did, oh, sorry. How did you... Uh, sorry, can I ask Clark, how do you like this conference and what's, what's your prospects on future from, yeah, from your point of view? Uh, Thanks for the invitation. I think it's a great conference, and I, I think Yossi made a great You are point. invited for next year. Thank Sit you. down. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the fact that it's not just tech and money is really important, and I think that was really proven uh, over the last two days here, also with Ashoka. So I think that's really great. We're working to try and help Europe catch up with the US and Asia, uh, and I think there's a long way to go. And uh, I think over the last two days, we saw a lot of really great points where Europe has some strengths that can hopefully be, be utilized. You are, you are the representative of the European Internet Foundation. We're the Internet Economy Foundation, and we're working on behalf of German and European the internet scene to try and help uh, yeah, get the frameworks in place to catch up. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. Any other views of the future? How about countries? What is the future of China? Yes, please. So I'm standing up. Here I am. I'm sitting down. My That's name is good. Thomas. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of a startup that expatriated from Bavaria to Israel last year. And I think we should ask ourselves the question where innovation is happening. Because, I mean, when you look in investments like in Grail, 100 million seed funding from Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and now Bill Maris from Google, we don't see that happen in Europe, and we hardly see that happen in Israel. However, the Chinese pour money into Israel. So where is innovation happening? Are we still in a position to create our own future, or are we going to be dependent on Facebook, Google, and all these companies? I think that's a question we have to ask in the U.S. Or maybe you will be dependent on Baidu, Tencent, and uh, Alibaba. Yossi, there's one guy in the room. Uh, we're both probably very particularly interested in, Steffi and I, um, about the prediction of the, f of the future. Who do you think this could be? I think it's you. Tell Me? us. Yeah, what's your opinion? Yeah. I mean, you're traveling, all the you're traveling all the time. Whenever we call you, you're either in Beijing or... Okay, first or of all, I have to talk about methodology. Okay. And then I will talk about the future. Methodology in two consecutive Conferences, I make opposite predictions, so in five years' perspective, I always write. You know, I can't take... <laughs> I go to, uh, to the conference where I made... Uh, and you remember what, uh, what, uh, what uh, Mark Twain said. He said that uh, predicting is a very tough job, especially as far as it's concerning the future. But what I, w I would like to share with you one thing, which I think this is really really very important, which, which happened to me, which I realized in the last few months. And this is, this is really something very fundamental. Those of us who are involved with startups and conference of startups, etc., saw an unbelievable, unbelievable growth in the number of people who participate in these conferences. I, I was involved in a conference in Barcelona which had uh, 2,000 startups Two years ago, 8,000 startups. Last year, 16,000 startups this year. And same one in Singapore, similar one in Singapore, 350, 2,700, and 7,100 this year. And I ask myself, what happened? Because in all my career, I never saw such a burst of, of, of interest, which is a proxy indication to something very fundamental which we don't realize yet. You know, it's like a volcano or a tsunami which is, 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 is erupting. And on my way to Singapore three weeks ago, I looked on the list of the people who registered to this conference which I chaired because I wanted to understand from where they are coming. And what I saw, and I will share it with you, I saw that contrary to this type of events of three years ago where you saw the, the, holy, the holy triangle of startups, big companies, and investors who want to 
to make love with each other, all of a sudden in the list of this conference, I saw people are coming from hospitals, from, from government offices, from NGOs, from art galleries, by the hundreds. And I ask myself, what happened that all this, that everybody on the globe, practically everybody on the globe, is all, all of a sudden interested in this phenomena? And I would like to suggest to you my hypothesis. Maybe I'm right, and maybe I'm wrong. This is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, agent of change in the history of civilization. People which are beginning, beginning to, this was the, it didn't exist nine years ago. Four years ago, it was a privilege only of people who consider themselves to be uh, economically well. But today, today, every refugee which goes from Turkey to the island of Lesbos on the sea is carrying one of these. This is more, uh, after maybe food, this is the most important thing. So now, instead of having uh, LinkedIn have 440 million members, we saw it this week when Microsoft bought, bought them. So let's say that technology people in the world are, I don't know, 250, 200 million people. Okay, but now, we, and, and they were the guys who were the, in the big companies, in the startups, etc. it was the privilege of a certain elite or certain education or certain group. Not anymore, not anymore. Today, everyone has this in the pocket. Today, everyone became aware, was exposed to the power of computing, to the power of connectivity, to the power of accessibility 24 by seven. And this became the subject of the aspirations of the 3.5 billion people, according Mary Meeker, from two weeks ago that you heard in record, all of them want to be part of it. All of them want to be part of it. This thing took a whole civilization and overnight changed the aspiration and the pop culture. This is not anymore a communication device. It was for a few years a social device. It's still, of course, but today, this is the aspiration of a whole civilization. When I was a kid, I was chasing, well, my, when my friends were chasing girls, I, chased, I used to chase vacuum tubes. You know, I said girls have, have only two legs, vacuum tube used to have six legs, much more interesting. It took me about five years to realize that maybe my friends were, there was something to their, <laughs> Today, I think, but all of us wanted to be the, the Beatles. The generation after me, all of us wanted to be the, the Maradona. Okay, today generation, every kid want to be, if he's an American, he want to be Mark Zuckerberg. If he's Chinese, he want to be Jack Ma. If he's German, he want to be... What do you think? Okay, everybody, everybody aspire to be connected. These are the role model. This is not only the role model, this is the pop culture of our time. This is the big thing, the one single big phenomena that I saw in the last 10 years. It really totally turned my thinking because of this growth, which I never saw. 100%, 200% year to year. It's something which is 300% year to year is something which I'm not used to. So go home and think what you can do with it, which will be either an economic suggestion or if from Ashoka, something which will help the world, like Ashoka should give a smartphone to every refugee in Turkey before he goes to the, to the sea or something. This is, this is a major change, ladies and gentlemen. This is such a huge change that we don't, I think we still don't comprehend the size of it. So if you ask me what I see, what I see, this is what I see. And if you want me to repeat my answer, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> you are pop culture. Pop culture is 
is... Let me, let yeah. me, let yeah. me prove my point. Anybody in the audience who is, who is, we will make a poll to see who is using mobile phone and who is not using mobile phone. Anybody who is using mobile phone, can you raise your hand, please? So I would say about 40% are using mobile phone. Everybody who is not using mobile phone, can you raise your hand, please? So the result of the poll, 40% use mobile phone, zero don't use, 60% don't understand my accent. <laughs> <laughs> when was the first time in your life when you realized, hey, this is a revolution what's going on? When your mindset changed, when was that? You know, <laughs> I, I was interviewed, I, I don't think it's important, but I, I will tell you, I was interviewed in 2004. And I was asked, what is the one trend, one trend which I missed? And I say it took me too long to understand the power of cellular because I understood it only in 2002. By perspective, uh, probably it was, not, it was not too late. But I have to tell you another thing. Recognizing trends too early is also a big mistake because if you recognize trend, you begin to be believe it. It's not believing it. It's not mature yet. You go and invest in it and you have to wait 15 years until it becomes a business opportunity and waiting 15 years and keeping the staff, etc., is not a, a cheap exercise. So as I told many times, out of my 86 investment in internet, 29 went bust. 86 investments in the internet. Yeah, 86. but 29 went bust, disappeared, nada, zero, gurnished, went away and number of them were because, it's too early. because it was much too early. So being too early is not good. Being too late, is all, it's like fruit. You know, if it's too early, it's not good. If it's too late, it's not good. You have to do it in the right time and nobody knows what is the right time. Yossi, tell us a little bit, what is DID Tel Aviv? Actually, we should, uh, we should play the video. DLD Tel Aviv is, uh, will take place this year between the 24 and the 29 of September. Uh, we had to expand it by, by two days because of the richness of event. Uh, uh, DLD Tel Aviv is a festival, which means that many third parties, partners are doing their own events. We are doing in an old train station, which definitely cannot contain the audience, so... Uh, there were almost 10,000 people last year there, or 8,000. No, like we that. had, I tell you exactly, we had 2,700 people from abroad and 8,000 Israelis in all the events. And the place cannot contain the people, so we rent tents. Uh, three years ago, we didn't have any tent. Two years ago, we had one tent. Uh, last year we had four tents, and this year we are only, or, already in nine tents. So we have the structure of nine tents, and I suggested uh, Ruti to call it on a name of a Syrian refugee camp, because it's going to look like a Syrian refugee camp. It's a lot of fun, a lot of parties. Last year we were very successful to create our special effect department was able to create something very special. Anybody was in DLD Tel Aviv last year? You're talking of the sandstorm? We, we, we created the biggest sandstorm in the history of Israel with 40 <laughs> degrees, 40 degree temperature. I must tell you, while our guests have been roasted a little bit, it was, it, it has done wonders for the brand because everybody who came to DLD sent 200 pictures to, for all his friends, you know, while they were choking, the brand just propagated. And if we have to select with our great guests will be choked and propagation of the brand or no choke and no propagation, we select the first one. So it worked very nice. This year, we are considering to prepare for the people who are coming a flood which remind me of the story of the insurance agent who came to a guy in Israel and told him, I want to sell you an insurance against fire and flood. And the guy answered him, I will buy the fire, but how, do, how, how, how the hell you start a flood? 
So this is about DLD Tel Aviv. Who wants to come to DLD Tel Aviv? What about all the rest? Yeah, we have to convince them. It's really, it's an amazing experience. I, I can recommend it by all means. It's, it's wonderful. If you, who of you have been in Israel? Who wants to stand up and to make shameless promotion to DLD Tel Aviv? <laughs> I'm looking for volunteer. All of you who haven't been in You, uh, go ahead. In, in Israel, please come. It's an, uh, say, say, I was blind until I went to DLD Tel Aviv and I began to walk <laughs> or something of that sort. Yes, please, Francesca. Ten years younger. And it's just not comparable. And after you have been there, you basically think about moving in the long run. We call, we so, call, I want you to know, we call this kind of objectivity a shameless Zionist propaganda. Yeah. So you were exposed to a shameless Zionist propaganda. But nevertheless, Yossi, it's, we all here in the audience have the impression that in the last two, three years, um, the state of Israel changed. Can you? Give us a remark on this. I'm not sure I want, you know. <laughs> this is an answer enough. Okay. No, we are doing, I have to tell you, we really do wonderful things. Yes. I will tell you one, one little story, but there are a lot of things that we have to fix. Let's, let's admit it. I will be the first one to praise the first one and to, and to admit the second one. I want to tell you one story that I think give you the essence of the nice things in Israel, and by that we will finish because these guys are subject, you know, to all this talk and they want to go home. Who wants to go home? Oh. They are afraid, they are afraid. <laughs> one wants to go home. Okay, let me tell you one story. I went two days ago to a funeral of the brother of a good friend of mine, Ami Ben Basat, you may know him. His brother died. This brother of him contributed a kidney to another brother. Nevertheless, and the people who knew him began to talk, you know, before we bury somebody in Israel, we used to say some nice things about him. I'm still looking who will say a nice thing about me. It's difficult to find, but nevertheless, it doesn't belong to the, the story. And I heard a story about this guy that I didn't know. And apparently, he was a field, a field service worker for a company which is doing biological control of insecticizers, of insects, and instead of using pesticizers, they developed a biological control, and they bring bees into the field, and these special bees are killing or eating, I don't know what, the, the undesired insect in order not to harm not to harm. And this, this brother of him, he was a farmer, and then he became Walking in the service, he go to other farmers and teach them what to do with the bees. And then they told the following story. They said he had a friend in the Volcani Institute. The friend in the Volcani Institute is a professor for the pollination of the flowers of the tomato. Tomatoes as flowers, if it's not pollinated, then it will not create the fruit or the vegetable. So this professor, this is an area. This guy, who was just a simple serviceman in the, in the field, was in continuous touch with this professor for his, for, not for work, you know, for his pleasure, for his interest, and he used to feed the professor with information how the flower of the tomato behave in extreme heat or in extreme cold. This is sent the information to the professor, the professor processed it and instructed the farmers how to cope with these issues. So you have, to think, you have to think about the social underlying thing. You need some guy who is very committed to look into this narrow expertise in a certain field just in order to increase 
the yield of tomatoes. The, the simple guy and the professor are collaborating in order to be excellent in tomatoes. Why I was interested in it? Because Israel has the highest yield of tomatoes per dunam. Israel has the highest yield of cotton per dunam. I knew the facts. I never thought what it takes in order to become. So you have this kind of crazy people which will do subject their life in order to find some very esoteric thing which will create another granulation, another piece of excellence. So I think this is the amazing side of Israel, but still we have issues. We have to resolve the issue with the Palestinians. The country is becoming more extreme to migrate sorrow. We used to, be, uh, we used to seek uh, to be liberal and just, etc. I will conclude this thing with another, another line of, of, of shameless Zionist propag propagation. Three years ago, one of the leading archaeologists in Israel by the name of Josef Gurfinkel found a piece of clay from 3,100 years ago. 3,100 years ago. The, the significance of this clay, it was the first time that Hebrew scribe, Hebrew language was found on a clay. It was a message from the past from 31 years ago. And what is interesting, what was written on the clay? There were 16 lines of the clay written in an old Hebrew writing uh, uh, fonts. And the message, listen to this, said that you have to judge the poor the widow, the kid, the, 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 the young one, the foreigner, you have to do justice with them, you have to take care of them. This was a message, the first message we got from, from the past. And this was in the life of my ethnic group, you know, the Jewish, the Jewish people, this was something we cherished, cherished for 3,000 years, and this is what guarded us, because we had always to create our own autonomous institutes in order to provide it. It didn't say that the central government has to do it. It said that the people has to do it. So when the, the, the king of Judea and the king of Israel were removed by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and, and all these guys, these institutes continue to exist, and this is what kept the nation without a land as a nation. The, these institutes of helping each other, of taking care, and not only of the Jewish people, also the foreign people which live among, among the Jews. I think we, as a society, probably as the whole world, you know, a civilization, we are losing a little bit of uh, this thing. So it was very nice from Dominic that in the opening, of uh, his, his talks, he talked he talk about that the old people should be also being taken care of. So thank you, Dominic. <laughs> thank you, Yossi, very much. And especially, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't comment on that, but it's, it makes so much sense to listen to you and what you've said in especially this place in Munich at the Haus der Kunst. That's a strength, a sign of strength, and that's very good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending DLD conference. Steffi, thank you very much for having the privilege working with you. Yossi, thank you very much for coming all the way from, where did you actually come from exactly? From Israel now? From the next neighborhood. From the next neighborhood. No, you went to Founders, right? I was, I was in London. In London. Um, we want to ask you now for a big applause for all the people you haven't seen, and we want to ask our team on stage and thank them for organizing that. Thank you.